Hello everyone and welcome back. Now, we've been talking about the wave equation, mostly in one dimension. So what I'd like to do in this brief video is give a little bit of credence to higher dimensional wave equations. Now, just like the heat equation, they're very hard to solve outside of very limited scenarios, such as maybe a disk like we did with the heat equation. Nonetheless, they describe important physical phenomena. So first of all, let's start with the 2D wave equation, okay? Now, in this case, maybe you could probably guess what it looks like. I'm going to use a very, very simple version of this thing. Uh, but in two dimensions, the wave equation looks like this, sorry. You get this second order in time, and you get your c squared, same thing that we've seen before. But then after that, you get your Laplacian operator, which I will remind you is the sum of second order partial derivatives in space. Okay, and in this case, I'm assuming that I'm working in some region of the two dimensional space, okay? Now the first thing that you might ask yourself is where does this equation come from? Before we answer that, I want you to take note of something and that's this guy right here. That's the same thing that encoded multidimensionality for the heat equation, right? That's what I want you to notice first and foremost here because again, it's the Laplacian operator. So even though whenever we started this lecture series, it felt like we were just talking about the heat equation and when we talked about the Laplacian, we talked about sines and cosines and Fourier series, turns out it's also relevant for the wave equation, okay? Now, where does this come from? Well, first of all, this can come from the same derivations that we did for a string, but in this case for what we refer to as a 2D string. In particular, that's what we call a membrane, okay? So this would be like a, a 2D string, okay? So if you remember what we did with uh, the original wave equation, we talked about a string and it's sort of describing its vertical displacement. In this case, we have u of x, y comma t. This is the vertical membrane displacement. Okay, so it's the same fundamental principles. If you wanted to, you could go through and you could derive this partial differential equation in exactly the same way we did for the string, right? The only difference here is that you have two spatial components. Now, the question is, what is a membrane? Well, you can think of a membrane as any sort of material that's going to, to sort of vibrate. What I like to do, my favorite application of this thing, is a trampoline. Right? Because if you think of your trampoline as being your sort of membrane, right? Essentially what you're having in here is you have sort of oscillations and waves taking place inside of the trampoline. So your, your disturbances could be your actual jumping on the trampoline. This could be, you know, your omega. And then on the boundary, what would be the boundary conditions for jumping on a trampoline? Well, this would be that u of x, y, t is equal to zero on the boundary of omega, right? And that would be your sort of fixed boundary conditions. Now, this is a really simple trampoline. Trampolines typically have springs that are holding you on the boundary, which would be very similar to this sort of spring mass system that we talked about uh, uh, two videos ago, but a very, very simple version of this would be, imagine you take like a, some sort of elastic -y or a rubber uh, substance and you just stretch it over something that it's all fixed on the boundary, there's no displacement on the boundary, and you sort of bounce stuff on it, right? So you can think about, like, for example, taking a, a rubber balloon and stretching it over the top of a, a jar or a cup or something like that. But of course, just like all problems in partial differential equations, you can have in higher dimensions very complicated boundary conditions, right? Uh, for example, if you're, if you're describing this on maybe a square, you could have different kinds of boundary conditions on every side of that square. It could be Dirichlet and Neumann. You could have uh, your sort of mixed Robert 
uh, or, or Newton's law of cooling boundary conditions. There are all kinds of boundary conditions that can be enforced here and they can describe all kinds of different physical scenarios. So of course this is a complicated expression, but if you wanted to, you could use separation of variables to solve my little trampoline problem, right? Because it's going to be very similar to what we did with the Laplace equation on a disk. You put this in polar coordinates and you can solve with, say, a fixed boundary at zero, if assuming that your, uh, your region in R2 is just a disk, right? So you can do it. There are places where you can do it. And I want you to try it. Go have a little bit of fun. But what I'd also like to talk about is the 3D way of equation. Now, in this case, it's a little harder to think of what a, th a 3D string would look like, right? Like a hypermembrane brain or something like that. Uh, but if we just look at this theoretically for a second, what would the partial differential equation look like? Well, if we talk about the 3D displacement of uh, our sort of 3D membrane, whatever it happens to be. Again, we get the same time derivative we see all the time. We get a C squared, and we're going to get a Laplacian operator again. Same derivation. But now the Laplacian operator is going to be the sum of second order derivatives in all three spatial variables. Okay. So... The question is, what is the use of this equation? Well, this thing comes up in a whole bunch of different contexts to describe waves moving through a three-dimensional spatial medium. So for example, uh, one example of this is elec, uh, uh, pardon me, elec, I started that off very poorly, I apologize, electrodynamics, okay, and in this case, we have that this term out, out front, c squared, this is um, the square of the speed of light. Okay, so because of the electro part here. And then this is divided by uh, these terms mu times epsilon, where, um, so again, c, c light, this is the speed of light in a vacuum. Uh, and in our case, mu is going to be the permeability of the permeability of the medium and epsilon is going to be the dielectric constant. So this is uh, getting slightly outside of my domain. Um, I'm not an electrical engineer. I, I'm hardly even a physicist if, I, if one would even be generous enough to call me that. So I'm going to sort of give you this just as motivation, right? This is, is very much a studied equation, the 3D wave equation, primarily, as you can see, by physicists. Uh, but let's take a look at a particular type of solution to this, this three-dimensional equation. Now, the same thing, you could get these same equations in 2D, they just have more meaning in 3D. And that equation is what's called a plane wave. Now, plane waves are very important types of solutions, and they carry a very simple form. They are a solution of the wave equation that looks like this. An amplitude multiplied by a complex exponent, e to the i, and then k1x plus k2y plus k3z minus omega times t. Now here I'm just using a complex notation because uh, this is really just sines and cosines. It's the same thing that we saw with the Fourier series. Sometimes it's just easier to write things in a complex notation. A could also be a complex number. All you have to do to make this real is separate it out into sines and cosines, and life is good, okay? But allow me to write this in complex notation so that um, it's, it's a little easier to look at. Now, in this case, we have this K which is k1, k2, and k3. It's a vector in three space, and it's called the wave vector. Okay, so here, I didn't tell you what these things are. In fact, it's actually going to work for any k1, k2, and k3. But essentially what this is, the direction of this vector is the direction that the plane wave is moving in. Um, so the direction of 
k, right, as a vector equals the direction of wave. Now, if you were to just take out the y and the z dependence, this would look like my traveling wave solution from the last video, right? X minus a, a, a multiple of t. In my case, omega is the sort of speed that things are moving at. And in, you also can take a look at the magnitude of the vector. So remember, this is just like in Euclidean coordinates. Right? You square all of the components, you sum them up, you, you take the square root. We call this thing the wave number. Okay, So sometimes you'll hear people talk about a wave number. Uh, that's all that this thing is. And it's really just equal to the number of waves in a 2 pi distance. So this is, a, again, a physical quantity in the direction so in the direction of the wave. And then, of course, on top of all of this, you can define uh, 2 pi over the wave number, which is just equal to the wavelength. Right? So these are all, if you're familiar with physics, uh, you, you're sort of probably familiar with a lot of this stuff. Now, Here's the thing, if you uh, take your derivatives here, if you put this thing in, take all of the derivatives, so put into the PDE, what this tells you is that, okay, if you take two derivatives with this out front, right here, right, so the negatives don't matter because you're taking two of them, you get i squared, which is minus 1. You're also going to get an i squared from each one of these, so the minus 1s wash away. You put this into the PDE, you get omega squared is equal to c squared times the wave number squared, which is just equal to c squared, and then k1 squared plus k2 squared plus k3 squared. And essentially what this tells you is that if you pick a direction to send your wave in, k1, k2, k3, then the speed of that wave is going to be determined by your wave number and this constant, which is coming up from the medium that you're actually working in. Okay? So different directions move in different speeds, right? Omega here is a speed because it's multiplied against uh, time. Um, and essentially what these things look like they look like big radio waves, essentially, right? It's these big, huge oscillations that happen in only one direction, right? And they move, as these big radio waves, they move with a speed. And essentially what we're seeing here is that the direction determines the speed, okay? Sometimes people call this thing a dispersion relation, okay? Uh, it's, the, it's sort of how your direction uh, relates to your speed, you're sort of dispersing these waves in this medium, okay? The other thing here is that you can see that, in fact, because of the square, you take a square root, you get plus or minus, of course, that means that, that plane waves come in pairs. One goes forward, one goes backwards. That's just like we saw with separation of variables with the 1D string, right? You pluck the string, you can think of it as traveling waves going in each direction on the spring, or on the string, sorry. Same thing is happening here, right? One plane wave moves in this direction, one plane wave moves in that direction. And it comes from this ambiguity here due to the squaring. Okay, so that's a sort of brief introduction to the wave equation. Now, really what I've shown you is that it's handled very similarly to the heat equation. But one major piece of this that's sort of outstanding is handling maybe different boundary conditions or more complex versions of either the wave equation or the heat equation, right? So what if I have a heat source? Or what if I have a non-uniform material, right? And these are all things that we're going to be able to address with the next topic of this lecture series. And that is eigenvalue problems in PDEs. In particular, what we're going to get into is looking at Sturm-Liouville problems. So I'll see you all in the next video, everyone.